My name is Linda Shai. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell, and I'm delighted today to welcome you all to the uh, to our guest lecture with Brittany Arona, who is a doctoral candidate at UC Davis, speaking about We Are the Land, challenging California planning laws through indigenous environmental practice praxis. This is part of the department's lecture series. We have two. One is a colloquium, and this one is part of our research seminar series. And we're really grateful to Brittany for rescheduling this event uh, from earlier in this fall, and to all of you for coming at 5 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon for Eastern time, and those of you, hopefully others, it's earlier in the afternoon for you. All right, just to refresh everyone, um, Actually, before we go any further, um, I'd like to invite Dylan Stevenson, uh, who helped organize today's session to give the land acknowledgement today. Dylan? Yeah. Thanks, Linda. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that uh, Cornell University is located on the traditional homes of the Gaya Gohono, the Cuyuga Nation. Um, the Gaya Gohono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. This confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gaia Gohono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gaia Gohono people, past, present, to these lands and waters. Thanks so much, Dylan. Today we have Brittany Arona giving our lecture and uh, this week we actually have two lectures in our research seminar. The one on Friday will be given by Dr. Siti Jung from MIT speaking about air pollution, avoidance behaviors and neglected social cost evidence from outdoor leisure and commuting behaviors. And then the following Friday we will have our final colloquium lecture of the semester given by our own Professor Nima Kudva uh, talking about Solidarity Stories, a project that she has been working on with other masters in planning students collecting stories of how people have actually formed solidarity during this very tumultuous year and I think that'll be a wonderful and inspiring end to the semester. Uh, before we I shift this over to Dylan um, I want to thank the department for supporting Brittany's lecture today as well as Chris Hinman and Elviano Stinson for coordinating and facilitating this talk. I'm also really grateful to Dylan Stevenson who organized this talk along with Jennifer, uh, Professor Jennifer Minner for helping organize um, this, uh, the, the strategy and thinking of inviting Brittany. Um, and we, I also see that Kurt Jordan and Jolene Reichert, um, we also consulted with them at uh, the um, at ASP for organizing this talk. So really grateful to have all of you here today. Um, let me introduce Dylan Stevenson. Uh, he is a PhD candidate in the department and his research focuses on environmental planning, particularly investigating the underlying values embedded with state level water planning frameworks to assess how indigenous worldviews can inform culturally competent approaches that promote tribal sovereignty and support indigenous communities. His other work considers the intersections between public health and urban planning by examining aspects of healthcare accessibility and food systems planning structures. He holds a bachelor's degree in linguistics with a minor in Native American studies from the University of California, Davis, and a master's degree in planning with a concentration in preservation and design of the urban environment from the University of Southern California. Dylan? Thanks. Um, so I'm very honored to uh, introduce Brittany and her uh, following presentation. Um, Brittany Rona is an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe and is currently a PhD candidate in Native American Studies with a designated emphasis on human rights at the University of California, Davis. Uh, her dissertation research evaluates Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk uh, perspectives of grassroots activism, traditional ecological knowledge, and environmental health through dam removal efforts and cultural rights movements of the Klamath River Basin. Uh, Brittany is currently a board advisor for Save California Salmon and was a 2019 uh, Schweitzer, Schweitzer Environmental Fellow. Um, and I think uh, without further ado, I'll let uh, Brittany uh, proceed with her presentation. Thank you, Dylan, and thank you um, all for, for having me. It's really quite an honor to be here and I, and I appreciate um, being able to share my research uh, with you all. So, um, Brittany, 
and um, you got my introduction. I always kind of do my introduction after that, but you, you, you know pretty much who I am uh, by now. But so my work really centers itself on indigenous environmental justice in California and looking at the ways that tribes um, in the state of California have been um, refuting narratives of uh, genocide, uh, genocidal practices through environmental um, degradation, infrastructure projects, um, really focused around water. So my work centers itself in um, environmental activism that looks at water infrastructure in the state. And so um, it's a pretty big topic for 45 minutes, I think, to go through the history of water in California. It's very complex. Um, but I'm going to try to give you a brief overview of the things that people are doing um, related to the Delta Conveyance Project in the Sacramento Bay Delta region, so Sacramento and the Bay Area region and I'll have a lot of maps to show you so you'll see where that's at and then the connections between that project and then tribes on the Trinity River and my own tribe is within on the Trinity River and that's our home um, and before I start my own presentation I'd like to acknowledge the lands that I'm on um, which is the Nisanan and Nisanan Maidu and Miwok land, lands um, I usually do a better introduction to that, but um, so I'm located within the Sacramento Valley in the central, central California. And the tribes of this region, I'll be talking about them a bit as their relation, they have a strong relationship with the Delta, um, the Delta itself. But the tribes of the region are still here, still practicing tr their traditions and still actively resisting projects that will infringe upon their tribal cultural rights, as well as their environmental rights. So without further ado, I'm going to switch to the next slide. So just to give you an overview of uh, California Indian tribal groups, so there's 109 federally recognized tribes in the state and then over a hundred other non-federally recognized tribes as well. So going off of the federal, federal recognition standard that determines tribal relationships with the federal government. But um, as you see here, this is broken down into uh, different tribal cultural groups. And so my own tribe is located um, in Northwestern California. I'm using my cursor, I hope you can see that, um, that centers around Hoopa. And then uh, neighboring tribes are the Yurok Karuk. And then in the Sacramento Bar Valley in the Bay Delta region, we see, uh, it's, which is this area right here, it's the Patwin, Nesanon, uh, Sierra Miwok, Northern Valley Yoka, it's Coast Noan, and Coast Miwok. And the way that I am describing this is, not, is a little bit imperfect because tribes are in California are incredibly complex. Our relationships to each other have been, um, we have had strong relationships with each other since time immemorial. We knew each other, didn't necessarily stay in our own regions. We traded, worked together, know each other, and, have, and know each other into the present. And then something just an interesting aside about California and um, California tribal linguistic groups. So if you look on the right, um, it's broken down into the different uh, language families that we have in California, very, very diverse. Um, so Athabascan, which is uh, now known as Diné, uh, which is where my people's language families are from, Algonquin, Hogan, uh, Yudo Aztecian, Yukian, and Pinu, Pinu Nation. So I, I probably mispronounced that. Um, but so it's very, very complex and our languages are very different from each other. So the neighboring tribes in my region, Hupa, Yurok, and Kruk, we all speak completely different languages. There's nothing similar about them, which is really interesting because our traditions and our um, environment are very closely related. So I'm centering, being a little bit Hoopa centric here, but I'm centering my tribe because um, I'll be talking a little bit about the Trinity and the ways that the Trinity water is diverted down into the Central Valley through the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. Um, but I introduce myself as Hoopa, that's what our formal name is, formal name is but really we're Natwene, uh, people of the place where the trails return. 
And so we're located in a pretty big valley in uh, Northwestern California, 12 miles by 12 miles, largest reservation in California. And so I use some of these example pictures just to designate the type of culture that we're in, what we do, how we, um, and how we are still situating ourselves into the present. So we still practice our traditions and water and salmon are incredibly important to us. And um, we are salmon people. That's how we designate who we are. So an important part, I think, of when we're thinking about indigenous environment is uh, place naming and the ways that Native people use linguistics still to designate um, places, even as they've been renamed. So I think in this cur current moment, and especially in California, there's been a big push to rename um, sites and go back to the indigenous naming practices in, of those places. So um, on the Trinity River, I'm not a good linguist or a hoopa linguist, so I'm not going to attempt to even say this word because I don't want to butcher it. But um, the word, the, this is the word for the Trinity River in hoopa, and it means as a power one should pray to. And then the second word um, under the longer word is hun, and hun refers to every other river system in the world. So if I'm here in the Sacramento Valley and I'm looking at the American River, I'm referring to that as Hun, and Hun is always referring back to the Trinity River, which is the first and most important river to the Hoopa people. Even, and it's a part of a, wait, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So one of the central questions that I've been asking myself, and this is taken from uh, Charles Sipovoldia's uh, Sacred Waters piece that he wrote for the for a for decolonizing education journal, um, and he's talking about the Santa Ana River, which is a really interesting article. I actually probably should have shared it for, to you so you could could read it, and I'm happy to share it after. But he asks this really important question: What does it mean to be rooted to a place that you have been dispossessed from? Um, California has gone through, like many places in the state, mass genocide, genocidal practices, um, settler colonialism, starting with, in 1769 with the establishment of this uh, Spanish mission system, and then continuing on with the 1840, 1849 gold rush, and continuing into the present. And so, the California State Legislature, too, had laws on this books, the very first one that was enacted, towards killing Native people to remove them off of land. Um, so the state of California, in its initial very early conceptions, had these laws towards both killing California Indian people as well as um, indentured, forced indentured servitude or slavery. Um, so California, as a state, already started through um, genocidal practices and genocidal laws. And so this whole talk today is a little bit about how those, the, the start of that and then continuing into the present and the ways that Native people are still dispossessed from their lands through environmental laws and tribal consultation laws. So this central question, question what does it mean to be rooted to a place you have been dis dispossessed from, dispossessed of? And I think this is a question that California Indian people ask themselves a lot. Um, you know, we have been dispossessed from our places, removed, um, situated away from the city, sometimes remaining in, the ur in urban centers, but most uh, reservations are located on, in rural places. So Hoopa is actually very, very rural. Um, getting up there takes about six hours through winding mountain roads and through an offshoot highway to get to the valley. Um, other places are also situated within the foothills. Reservations are in rancherias in the Sacramento Valley are situated away from the city. Um, so people have been disp dispossessed from their place, but still carry the memories of those pl places and still tell stories of areas that have been built up and are now being like uh, riverways that have been diverted. So there's a lot of stories about the way that the Sacramento Valley used to look. It was pretty much a marshland, um, Bay Delta, it's really big. 
and the way that it used to look is completely different from the way it is now as an agricultural and urban space. Um, same in the Klamath River Basin. Klamath River used to be a mighty river and now it is not as mighty and we have to fight for those water allocations every year. So just to situate you into the Klamath, so I know this is the first time I mentioned the Klamath, but the Klamath is an offshoot, is the wider basin waters and the Trinity River is its largest tributary. So um, it's important to note that the Klamath and the Trinity are inherently connected to each other. So people who do advocacy both around the Klamath are also doing advocacy for the Trinity. And so Klamath, the Klamath River has diversions that go up into uh, Southern Oregon towards Oregon farming interests. And that is situated through dams that are on the upper Klamath on the Upper Klamath and yeah, on the Upper Klamath Basin. So that's my dissertation research. And that's what I focus mainly on, the advocacy around that issue. Um, I also look at in the Trinity, Trinity River area. So the Trinity is affected by those diversions that go into Southern Oregon, but then also by two dams on the Trinity that divert water, <laughs> that divert water down to the Sacramento Valley. So you'll see the Lewiston Dam and the Trinity Dam. And so the river faces two diversions in two different directions, making for often dangerous and um, uninhabitable conditions for salmon. Um, we often have toxic algae blooms that pop up every year. And almost every year, like clockwork, we are um, protesting at the Bureau of Reclamation to release more water, either from the Lewiston and Trinity dams or from the Klamath River so that the Trinity can uplift itself. So water in California, I told you that I was gonna condense the history down really, really small and really centralize it within the um, Klamath the Trinity Klamath Basin and then within the Bay Delta. So the majority of water in California is diverted from Northern California to Central Southern California for urban and agricultural use. It's about 80% of the water is diverted down. Oh wait, 90%. 90% of the Trinity River's average annual flow is diverted to the Sacramento River. That's a huge amount of water that's being diverted. And then Klamath River flows are often diverted to Oregon farmers, creating added pressure um, on both ends of the Trinity. So most water is situated and removed from Northern California down to the Central Valley in Sacramento. And so that inherently um, creates conflict between agricultural interests in the Central Valley and um, also water users in Southern California. So much of the water goes towards agricultural and um, uh, water users like personal use. Like, I should know the, the term better, but <laughs> the, ta the, the things that we use water for every day uh, when it comes out of the tap. Domestic. Domestic, thank you. <laughs> um, so this is just an overview of different water projects throughout the state. So as I mentioned, you know, the <clears throat> California was pretty, at, at initial colonization, was a very lush place. Like you get these narratives from Spanish missionaries talking about how it's a garden and how beautiful, how beautiful it is. And the marshlands that encompass it, company com company it, um, the lush rivers, the, the streams, everything that encompasses and makes California beautiful was described in the um, early Spanish missionary texts. Uh, the interesting the thing though about California is that almost as soon as the um, colonization starts, there starts to be more water diversion and water projects that are ongoing into the 20th, 20th and 21st century. Um, so this is just a map of what California water projects look like in the state right now. Um, I should have gotten a better picture so you could see how it diverts down to Southern California. But um, you could see the different types of um, aqueducts that come out, reservoirs, um, different diversion, Delta, the Delta project, which is right here. 
um, dip canals, the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct, which is a very famous case of beautiful valley being flooded uh, for water use. So there, there's a lot that happens in the state surrounding water, and there's a lot of political issues that come, to say the least, that come up around uh, water usage in, in California. Um, but it's important here, I think, to note too that California was very, very beautiful at colonization, not just because, not because that was naturally the way it looked and it suddenly sprung up from, you know, somewhere. It was because California Indian people had tended that area for since time immemorial for generations, had lived and worked on the land, understood land management and land use. We're seeing catastrophic fires right now because of um, ignoring uh, controlled burning that tribes have advocated for for decades. And are now, it, now it's coming into a vogue, I guess, to do those types of burns because it's shown that fire is actually beneficial for land if it's managed and tended. So I just wanted to point out that much of California is now, California water is now regulated very heavily. So it doesn't look like the way that it did. And so going back to this question, what does it mean to be, dis, to be rooted to land that you've been dispossessed from. And we have, you don't necessarily have the, re, the true memories of what that place looked like, but you know, you, you know that land base very well. And I think this is a central question that comes up for California Indian people and indigenous people, native people throughout the world. Like our worlds were catastrophically changed when we went through an apocalypse. And that apocalypse occurred over land too. So water diversions, just to give you a sense of what happens with water diversions in, um, on river systems, water diversions contribute to fish kills on the Klamath and Trinity. So in 2002, there's a major fish kill. And every year after that, we advocate for more water allocations so that there is not another one. It's not necessarily a very sustainable way of going about um, environmental uh, protection. So to get into a little bit about the, the um, Bay Delta and the water, the, the Twin Tunnels project. So in two, this is a long ranging project. So something to, to also mention about California is that there are two separate state and federal um, water projects that are intertwined and interact with each other. So the Delta Tunnels Project, which is based in the Bay Delta, is a legacy of the California Water Project. And that was started by Governor Pat Brown and then carried on into the Governor Jerry Brown's administration, both in the first administration that he was in and then in the most recent, the second one. Um, and so the tunnels are, are a continuation of that California water project that diverts water down into the Central Valley in the Sacramento, um, sorry, Sacramento, down into the Central Valley, Valley in Southern California. Um, and so the original plan was in July 2017. Oh, sorry. Sorry. The original plan was that there was going to be two tunnels um, that connected to aqueducts down into southern in Central Valley in Southern California. Um, and then in 2017, uh, it was it turned into the California Water Fix Project. So this is like I'm condensing down a lot of history in like maybe two or three sentences, but um, it turned into the California Water Fix. And it was controversial from the start, mainly because people in the Delta, and the Delta is a um, farm farming community a farming area and so the people in the delta were worried about the mass allocations of water from the delta region to go and support central valley and southern california agricultural interests without their interests being um, uplifted or heard too and then um, tribes also were concerned because of the water that's diverted from the trinity river in northern california where that it's diverted from the trinity river we're going to be continue to be allocated down into the Delta, creating continuous conditions of um, 
continuous problems and conditions within the, sac the, salmon, the Trinity rivers. Um, also, so tribes in the Delta area, which I'll talk a little bit about more at the, um, towards, as I, I, as I continue on with this presentation, uh, tribes in the Delta were concerned about tribal cultural resource protection and uh, tribal environmental protection as well. Um, and I'll go through a few of the laws that um, interact with that space too. But in April 2019, um, the highly anticipated water uh, water resiliency portfolio came out and Governor Newsom, who is our Governor Gavin Newsom, who I imagine is pretty famous in other parts of uh, California, but he uh, decided that the Bay Delta tunnels would continue as a single tunnel project. So that means that all the work that was done on the previous California water fix and what was previously then previously before that, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, um, would be scrapped and um, documentation and environmental compliance related to that would be would not be used anymore only in places where they felt like there was a strong enough connection so this is what the tunnels look like too um, this is what the proposed one tunnel system looks like now and then another issue that comes up with the Bay Delta Tunnel through an environmentalist, environmental lens is the extinction of the Delta smelt, which is a um, species of fish that only exists within this area and is currently in danger of being extinct if it's not already extinct, extinct already. Uh, so numbers dwindle every year because of the um, the existing infrastructure infrastructure that's in place in the Delta. So it makes it really hard for fish to move through the Delta when there are components of water infrastructure that suck them every which way, uh, which is what occurs now on the Bay Delta and would be heightened with the new tunnel. So this is just a simplified, sorry, this I should have got a better map or looked at it a little bit better. But um, so this is just a simplified map of what this area looks like. So you see the Trinity up here. Uh, there's a connector on the Trini on Trinity Lake at the Lewiston Dam that then um, situates water down into the Sacramento Valley and then pumps down into the Central Valley in Sacramento region. And the red is the uh, potential area for the tunnel. Okay, so I also want to give um, a little bit more information about the tribes in the Bay Delta region. So the ones that I mentioned that are most impacted on their lands, what would be their, that are their ancestral and current lands um, by the Bay Delta project. So they are represented, and I mentioned them a little bit earlier today, but they're represented by um, the I own Band of Miwok Indians, Northern Valley Yoka, Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians, United Auburn Indian Community, Welton Rancheria, the Winnem and Wintu, who actually are up near Shasta Dam and the Shasta Lake area, uh, Wintu Tribe of Northern California, and the Yocha Dehe Winton Nation. So all of these tribes have expressed concern and interest in the Bay Delta region and the Bay Delta and the um, Delta Conveyance Project. So just to go into a little bit about environmental laws that, i sorry, tribal consultation laws that interact with these spaces. So um, like any water infrastructure project, the Delta Conveyance Project has to go through um, environmental legal review. So both at the federal and at the state level. Um, so the state level, we have California Environmental Quality Act, and so the California Environmental Quality Act um, acts a lot like NEPA, but just at the state, on the state side. So going through clean water projects, environmental laws, biology, and then a major component of that that was is new in 2014 is AB 52. So AB 52 is a tribal cultural resources law, and it requires that tribal cultural resources become a resource within a CEQA. CEQA compliance. So that can 
and that means usually like archaeological sites. Um, it could also mean sites of significance or importance because in California, uh, sacred sites are not always associated with archaeological sites. So places where you would like dig things up, they can be landscape, they can be mortar holes, um, they could be any number of things that the tribe determines that it is. Um, so AB 52 requires consultation and um, interaction with tribes related to tribal cultural resources in the CEQA, in CEQA law. Um, I think that it's an interesting law because it narrowly looks at tribal cultural resources. I think that when we're thinking about the um, native people in the environment, that our worldviews aren't always centered within just thinking about parceling out tribal, this is a tribal cultural resource based on the California Historical Register. You know, a lot of the things that we interact with are holistically this, are similar and interact within the environment as well. So something that maybe an archeologist or historian wouldn't think is a tribal cultural resource is a tribal cultural resource. So I'm thinking of an example that comes from Mendocino County. I should, I wish I had a picture of it, but it's a large rock outcropping that is um, up on Highway 101. And if you're driving up that highway, you notice it, it's really distinct. Um, and every time I, you would see it, I was like, oh, that, that, that was an important place to somebody. And it turned out that it was an important place to the Pomo people. But it's not necessarily something that historians or archaeologists would necessarily would think is a tribal cultural resource. And so this is where I think the law fails a little bit, is that our holistic way of looking at the environment and ourselves and the way that we interact with each other um, in our place in the world doesn't fit neatly into a checkbox of um, CEQA regulation or environmental regulation. So SB 18, I'll, I'll go through these other ones a little bit quicker because AB 52 is kind of the point of contention and one I, I think about the most when I'm thinking about planning laws. But um, SB 18 was, is putting tribal cultural resources within uh, general plan guidelines for local governments. Um, Executive Order B 1011 uh, came out from the Governor Jerry Brown's administration and this requires all California agencies to establish tribal culture, sorry, tribal consultation policies and ways to interact with tribes um, on a government to government basis. So the federal government has this with federally recognized tribes. B1011 opens up a relationship between California state and tribes and then also non-federally recognized tribes. So that's a big part of this too. And I also should mention AB52 also includes non-federally recognized tribes. So there is recourse for tribes in that, non-federally recognized tribes in that law, which I think is a good thing. Um, and then most recently in the picture that I have here is from um, the governor's apology. I think this made national news. Uh, Governor, Governor Gavin Newsom apologized to uh, California Indian tribes, governments, and people for the genocide that occurred in California from within the tutelar time frame of 1846 to 1873. So I think it's interesting that there is an apology for genocide that occurred in the state, but it also only fits within a narrow view of when genocide occurred. And I think many Native people today would insist and say that cultural genocide um, is still occurring to us as it relates to environmental projects that are taking resources from our lands and not letting us have the ability to live on our lands. And some advocates that I'll be talking about a little bit later basically said that in relation to this apology. But the apology um, also inclu uh, includes a truth and healing council. So this truth and healing council is being established right now from um, we have a governor's tribal advisor to in the state. Um, who's from Dry Creek Pomo Nation. And so she's establishing this Truth and Healing Council that will discuss reconciliation efforts between the state of California and California Indian tribes and people. So it's 
it's pretty innovative. It's just interest. I, I think that um, there's definitely trying to think of the best way to, to say this. You know, apology is great and it's Im important and it's important to recognize the things that happen to us, but there's going to be continuous and ongoing removal and dispossession of our lands that happens. And so how is the state reacting to that and working with us? And why are water projects and infrastructure projects being approved without like true and real consultation or collaboration with tribes on it? So I, I talked about this. Actually, this is uh, the rock I was talking about. It's, it's very impressive when you see it in person, but it's um, Frog Woman Rock in Mendocino County. But I already went over what the AB52 is and how it situates itself within the um, Environmental Quality Act. And so under CEQA, you do have to do um, or have the potential to do an environmental impact report. And for the Delta Conveyance Project, it's 100% certain that they're gonna be doing a um, EIR. So Trinity Bay Delta Connections, um, something I wanted to bring up here too is that um, initially with the Delta Conveyance Project, when it was announced in January, 2020, um, that this was going to, to happen and that they were gonna do another tunnel, a single tunnel system, um, tribes in Northern California and actually in the Bay Delta too asked, well, how is this going to impact the Trinity River? Like, is this going to be continuous, continuously impacting and removing water from the Trinity? And so there was a big activism movement that happened in Redding in February 2020, where tribes from the Winnemun Wintu, from uh, Yurok Nation, Kurukupa, um, Miwok peoples too, joined in Redding. And um, at the scope, the first scoping meeting of the Delta Conveyance Project, and said, "You need to actually have a um, sorry, my cat almost knocked up something over. Um, that you actually have to have a Northern California scoping meeting to talk about this issue, because um, they weren't originally going to do it. And so, to the credit of the lead agency, which is Department of Water Resources, they did do it." And so they went up to Northern California and heard the concerns that California Indian tribes in the region, environmental advocate, advocates, so the board that I'm on, Save California Salmon, we had representatives up there asking these really tough questions about the conveyance project. Um, so this, this kind of brings me to this quote, which I really like, and it's from Charles Sipovildia, no, sorry, it's from uh, Leanne Simpson, The Land is Pedagogy, which I hope you had a chance to read. I know that I sent it a little bit late, um, but I think it's a really influential article and has really influenced me in the way that I think about decolonial praxis and how we are combating settler colonialism um, through advocacy. But um, so she says, being engaged in land as pedagogy as a life practice inevitably means coming face to face with settler colonial authority, surveillance, and violence. Because in practice, it places indigenous bodies between settlers and their money. Um, I think that's a very powerful quote and interacts with the way that tribes are situating themselves in California. I mean, we've been protesting these types of projects since way before I was born before my grandpa's time too, like his father was involved in some of the early protests around the Klamath River Basin dams. Um, and, and a lot of it, you know, is situated within money, source, money sources as well. So Westland's Water District, which controls much of the water in the state and is attached to the federal um, water project, stands to make a lot of money from moving water in diversions down to agricultural interests. I mean, California is the fifth largest economy in the world, and a lot of it is situated within agriculture. And so tribes have, are up against this kind of force of um, big money through agriculture, and then water districts too, that make quite a bit of money off of water tradings and dealings. Um, but I think in that, we have put ourselves in, 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 in danger 
um, against the settler colonial forces, but we can't, we can't necessarily stop because a po very popular thing in saying, I think that occurs both on, in the Bay Delta and in the Trinity and Klamath region areas. It's like, if we lose that place, we lose who we are. And that, that place has changed so much from what our, what our ancestors were interacting with, but it's so important to the way that we see ourselves and how we engage with the environment. Like I stop, I don't, I'm not a hoopa person if we don't have salmon. Like if we don't have our water, don't have our lands, we, we cease to be fully hoopa or fully Miwok or fully Winamamuntu. And so you see like there's so much of that environmental fight from tribes because of this. And so one of my major critiques about environmental laws too, and some of the ones that I have talked about and some of the things that I'll, I'll reiterate too, is that they don't fully holistically look at the ways in which native people are engaged in their lands. Um, so the reason that the Delta Conveyance Project wasn't going to do a scoping meeting, the Department of Water Resources wasn't going to do a scoping meeting in Northern California, because they couldn't see the connection between the Trinity and the Bay Delta. They parcel out land as if the only thing that occurs happens in that one space. When indigenous and native people know that when you, when something happens on the Klamath, it, it happens to rivers in Southern Oregon. It happens to rivers in California and beyond. So there's this holistic relationship that has, has been unbroken between water systems. But unfortunately with state laws and federal laws, it can be parceled out where it's such a narrow scope of what we look at and how we think about the environment. And so I really like the Land as Pedagogy um, article because it asks us all, and me too, because you know I'm a PhD candidate, and, you know I, I'm in the academy and situate myself in that way. How are we having relationship to land? And how do we understand land? Um, and how are we looking at land from an indigenous uh, framework? And you don't have to be indigenous to appreciate that, I think. Um, but we, we've been tied into these laws that are um, well-intentioned, but not always successful in getting um, land back or situating tribes within those places. So I think it's kind of interesting that this initial talk was called how laws can incorporate um, indigenous knowledge. <laughs> but I'm kind of saying, well, they're, they're not, they're falling short. So I'm sorry, Dylan. <laughs> um, so on the left is one of my favorite quotes from Brian Tripp. It's a poem, uh, Through My Body Flows, and he's a Kruk artist up in Northern California. Through my body flows blood of singers and dancers, makers of dance regalia, carvers and basket makers, gatherers, hunters and fishermen, and believers in the traditional religion and the old ways. I know I am these people, and I have done all these things many, many years ago. So that's also, I think, an important component. It's like we're very connected to our ancestors and the ties to our place and who we are, at least in, you know, the Hoopa Valley, like very strong ties to those people who have gone before, even if our lives and have been disrupted and changed. And so we'll always fight for the environment and fight for our, our, our rights to live. And then on the right um, is Ron Reed, who is a Karuk. Act activist for the Klamath River areas and his son Charlie who um, is now a father himself and a master student at Humble State. I just want to give them a shout out because they do a lot of great work on this as well. So as I mentioned tribal advocates go to scoping meetings, advocate for the Delta Conveyance Project, uh, advocate to discuss the Delta Conveyance Project in North State. And many tribes are still against the Delta Conveyance Project, um, even though it's situated down into one tunnel, still has a chance to impact those regions pretty, those areas pretty heavily. And so, yeah, I already talked about this, but this was at one of the advocacy um, meetings in Reading. So free our salmon. 
And the interesting thing about the the activism movement around water in California, it's like, you know, many, many of us will get a call and say, hey, can you go to Reading tomorrow? It's like, yeah, let's, let's go to Reading tomorrow. Hey, can you go to Sacramento? Uh, I can't be there, but can you walk down the street and go and protest at the State Water Resources Control Board? Like, yeah, okay, I could do that on my lunch break. Um, so it's it's an interesting tie that we have to each other in the way that we talk to each other uh, about water. And I, I think it's one of the most supportive environments I've ever been on in. Um, we really do care about what happens in the Bay Delta too, to our relatives in, of the Winnemun Wintu, the Miwok, the Winton Nations, the, and the Maidu and Yokuts people. So um, this is where it's at right now, the environmental review process, which maybe many of you are familiar with um, in planning. So they are doing the initial outreach meetings right now. They did the initial outreach meetings they lasted from February to April, um, and then the, the orange designates where the public participation or the outreach will, happen, will occur. So the SCOPI meetings, the SCOPI meetings already happened. Right now, they're at the scoping summary reports. So I've been following this. It's, it's, that's pretty much where they're at right now in November. Well, it's December now, but in December, and then um, the EIRs generally take about three or four years. That's what they're hoping for. They can last as long as 10 years. So that's also a thing too. But um, this one, because of the prior work that's been done, it's likely going to be a little bit faster. But um, I do want to point out, and I mentioned it, the orange parts are where the outreach activities happen. And so Despite these, you know, laws being in the books and continuing and tribes, you know, are an in important part of the EIR, EIR process, it's still like, this is when we talk to tribes right here at this point. It's like, okay, so we're going to, we do this, we did the SCOPI meeting, we're doing the consultations. We did it. Great. Now time to move on to the agency outreach plans and the technical reports. And to me, that's not really um, good enough. You know, many of these decisions are made behind closed doors on things that are related to our lands. And we don't really necessarily even know what the decision processes are or how, how they occur. You know, who, who makes the decisions and why? Um, and were there tribal people at the table? And I'd argue that this whole process does not allow uh, tribes to be at the table and does not allow, uh, to allow tribal community members to be at the table either. Um, because the project was proposed without consent either. So nobody talked to tribes and said, hey, you know, we're gonna change these two tunnels to one. It was just announced in a press release. And so, so that, that makes the relationship a relationship of mistrust. And so I get questions a lot from agency folks. So it's like, well, why don't, tribes trust us in these processes it's like well we have to think about the ways in which we're doing this stuff and also the long history in california around genocide and enslavement that occurred in the state at the beginning of the state so tribes are not going to inherently trust the state of california because of that too um so i just want to put that in your minds maybe as you go out into the world and you're thinking hopefully thinking about indigenous people in the places that you're at and how these things impact them and how reports impact them because i know that it's easy to get really see a narrow view of where you're at um, but these projects impact people and impact lands that have been that people have been dispossessed from so I, I think that there needs to be more collaboration and a collaborative approach. And if the governor's administration is really sorry for this genocide, then that has to, like something has to change within that process. It can't just be words, it has to be an action. So um, I think I'm at 30 minutes, <laughs> maybe 45, but um, I'll leave you with this. So this is from Charles Sopavolia, and I'll send that article to you all so you can read it. Um, so 
he's talking about land here in the Santa Ana River. He said, even if this connection is severed, the power of the land itself remains and the living relationships can be renewed. So I think that's a really important point too. And something that I've heard from um, actually environmental planners that I've worked with that talk about like urban spaces and they'll say, well, you know, tribes don't care about these urban spaces because it's all built up or, or you know, California Indians don't care about this water anymore because the infrastructure has changed. The, the, the environment has changed. It's like, no, we maintain these relationships with our place and they can be renewed. Like no place is hopeless and no tribe gives up on their lands despite the ways that they look now. Um, people remember that place. And I think about in Oakland with, or oh, Berkeley, sorry. In Berkeley with the West Berkeley Shell Mound, and if you are not familiar with that space, you should look it up. But the West Berkeley Shell Mound is completely covered over. It looks like a parking lot. But the Ohlone people still go there and have advocated to save that space development because it's important to them. And so I leave you with that. Like tribes really have a connection to their lands and have not forgotten that connection. So um, th thank you. Thank you, Brittany, for that um, great talk. Uh, I don't think I see any questions just yet. Um, so maybe I can just kind of like selfishly ask you a question myself, if that's okay with you. Um, I think I really appreciate how you were talking kind of about the limitations of environmental policies and um, kind of critiquing the current uh, consultation framework for you know statewide plans and I think that also exists um, well beyond the state um, level I think especially for um, county municipal all sorts of types of development projects um, I think oftentimes tribal consultation is very much a checkbox on a list of things to do and so obviously there needs to be more since all cities um, are exist on Indian land. Um, I think since this is a planning uh, sponsored, planning department supported kind of seminar, I'll ask you kind of a planning leaning question. Um, but you definitely talked about um, kind of how your work over time has changed and you've, you've understood, I guess, the problem that you're looking at in different ways. So the question is kind of about you. How has your, I guess, understanding on this type of work changed over time? Um, I guess as a Hoopa person, as an academic, as a Hoopa academic, uh, any which way. And um, what kind of future do I guess you hope to create or um, advocate for? Um, I guess to the world broadly and that's kind of like a really big question but I just want to I guess hear your your take on it. No I mean, I mean I think that's a that's a great question I mean if you you know look me up <laughs> I guess <laughs> um, I I worked for the state for a very long time so that's a component of it too um, and so I, I've worked in federal local and state government since I was 18 I'm 33 going on 34 right now um, and so really went into it hoping to, to change from internally, the, the internal changes that I wanted to see in the state. And I think to the state's credit that there has been, that there has been quite a, a turnaround from when I was working 10, 14 years ago when people totally ignored anything that Native people were saying um, to really this consciousness that's happening about indigenous lands and the places that we're at. And there's a lot of credit that goes to that from tribal advocates that have been doing that work, both in California and beyond. Um, so I don't wanna be dismissive of anything that has happened um, in, in that front, because it's important. I think situating my, my own self, you know, um, really spending a lot more time with my people in, in thinking about, um, how we can see our decolonial futures 
And so that article that I've been referencing a lot talks about that. It's like, how are we um, imagining and thinking about our worlds as decolonized? And the state is inherently colonial. Mm -hmm. So there's this push and pull that happens for me personally about it because there's, I, I have a, you know, I still have a relationship with the state and, um, but I want to see a decolonial future for people. Um, and honestly, I don't have a I have, I don't have an answer about what the right way is to go about it. I lean more towards decolonization and, um, working with my tribe and related tribes on getting our lands back. That's a really important thing. Mm -hmm to me um, that we do have our lands back and we can situate ourselves in our place again and have the freedom to be away from violence too because native people are still they still face both ecological violence physical violence missing and murdered indigenous women and girls corporate violence you know we, we're still situ facing all that stuff mm -hmm. um so i i think a lot about that and and if there are there can be laws that help native and indigenous people towards justice but i don't know i i i can say that maybe 10 years ago i thought differently than the way that i think now mm -hmm. um and that's not to say that there isn't again great work being done but it's it's it, there's a lot of education that still needs to happen um, yeah. yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think so. Um, no, I think it's uh, very much something that um, a lot of um, Native people and people in general doing this type of work are trying to like grapple with is that, you know, governments are still, you know, supporting the settler colonial project and it's kind of how do you navigate those two at times very, a lot of times very competing issues especially regarding land. So yeah, thank you. Um, there was a, a question from uh, Nadi Subramaniam, uh, if you'd like to ask. Thanks, Brittany. I really enjoyed through your images how you constructed different versions of California's waterscape and just the land. So thanks for that. Uh, so I have a question which is more about the role of uh, rituals and traditions in continuing to sort of, re, you know, renew the relationship to land and water, as you mentioned. And uh, what do you, uh, as a member of the Hoopa tribe, see in terms of involving uh, non-native communities in those rituals and uh, practices for others to build similar uh, approaches or relationships to land and water? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. Um, you know, Hoopa, we, and I can't speak for like all California Indian and indigenous people, but in, in Hoopa, you know, our, our dances are fairly open for people to come and see and, and, and interact with. We do something called the world renewal ceremonies um, and they occur either once a year, depending on what tribe you go to or twice or, or once, sorry, once every two years or once every year <laughs> depending on the tribe that you're you're around and you're interacting with um because the hoopa yurok and crooks are very similar and we have similar traditional um timetables but they are fairly open um for people to come and see and interact with and see how we um interact with water spaces too so i talked a lot about salmon and salmon being an important component of our cultural and ceremonial life and it is um, but water is central as well. And I think I mentioned that a lot, but, um, you know, we need a part of the reason we need a lot of water allocations too, um, is so people can dance up and down on boats on the river. So it's quite a sight to see like a huge, like redwood canoes with people dancing up and down on the river on them, um, to go to the, the, the village sites. So water is, is very central. Um, and you know, I, th I think people are interested in the ceremonial practice. I mean, we're, we are the only ones that can do it. Um, 
you, you have to be a member of the tribe to do it, but people, but the reason that we do these ceremonies is to remake the world for everybody. So it's not just us, it's, it's everybody in the world. So by that logic, everybody is involved with it because, you know, we, we are dancing for you. Um, we're dancing for for everybody in this audience like everybody we were dance dance with um something that's occurred in and this is all i'll end after this but something that's occurred at least related to the klamath river dams um has been a strong allyship between tribes and uh, recreational fisher people and they may not have like the same cultural connections to land but they love to fish <laughs> and fish are also essential for them um, so even if like people don't necessarily understand the cultural um, or ceremonial practice we do they become involved because they're protecting our waters and river systems too so that they can use it as well so I always thought that that was kind of a nice thing that occurred and happens and same with commercial fishermen like commercial fishermen need salmon to survive and need those ocean salmon to get out and so they can have big catches and to sell them and so we've had relationships we have relationships with them too um maybe not in the same like we don't think about it the same but it, it's a connecting thing that ties us together oh there's a question from uh jenny minner jenny did you want me to read it or did you want to ask hi thank you so much for your talk it's excellent i'm learning so much and i really loved what you said about we're dancing for you um and maybe you already really spoke to my last question um i'm not sure um i'm wondering can there be true co-management of water resources in a settler colonial context and then going back to um, the truth and healing council are reparations on the table and do you have perspectives that you would want to share about that yeah I, I think with the I'll start on the truth and healing council um, you know I, I do have critiques of these types of things, but I also think that with the Truth and Healing Council, to its credit, it's it's fairly open, and most of the members of that council, which I believe is going to be announced in a couple weeks, maybe if not sooner, um, are Native and Indigenous people. So they are people that have been nominated by tribal governments to to talk about what true healing would look like in the state. Um, so that's a that's a credit to that administration for doing that um, because it could be a completely different thing. Um, that's also how a lot of truth and reconciliation commissions tend to look uh, too. But um, I think that from what I've heard and what I understand, like any ma manner of discussion is up for discussion in that space. So reparations for genocide is probably on the table, both in the past and the present. Um, I think right now there's a lot of push for land back. That's like the big movement that's been sweeping across the world, I would say. But especially in California, you hear that call um, for land back and for our lands back. And in just an aside, in Yurok, oh, sorry, in Eureka, California, which is in Northwestern California too, um, the Wiat people who are on the coast they just, after spending 30 years trying to get um, an important island, Tulawat, Tulawat back, they, the city of Eureka returned it. Like it took a very long time and a lot of tribal advocacy and work between the city and um, state actors too, but it's returned. And so now they have that land back. But I think something to also consider within the land back movement is environmental remediation what happens when you get your land back and it's contaminated well, what do you do like how are you i mean hopefully the state will have already taken care of it but if they don't then how are you holding the state and local actors to that standard of well we can't have environmental contaminants in our lands we have to have 
remedi actual remediation. And so in that case, the tribe paid for the remediation, which, you know, maybe they shouldn't have, or maybe they, they wanted to, but you know, uh, whose responsibility is it? Um, I would say it's the state and local government to, to clean that up. So that's a, a whole aside on that. Um, I think co-management of water resources. Um, so the state of California right now is going through, the governor actually just put out a statement of policy for ancestral lands. So requiring and asking state governments to look at quote unquote excess lands or opportunities for co-management that could actually, that could be a benefit to both the state and tribes. So that's fairly innovative too. Um, it, it stops short of being land back because it's still a co-management agreement. I think in water resources, it's much more complicated because of the moneyed interests that are attached to it. Um, and because of the um, water, right, water, water claims that people have, um, to you know the riparian water rights that occur in the river system and in, in rivers and who has first rights towards that water um, I would hope and this is also just another thing too on the Klamath River you know tribes don't want to take all the water back just for them you know there there is this understanding that we have a major agricultural interest and there is there are a lot of people aside from us that depend on water and but there needs to be a give and take that occurs and happens there the agricultural industry hasn't been asked to change their planting process almonds are still in abundance in california rice like nobody else has had to change their way of life it's tribes that have had to bear the brunt of that so i think until there is a recognition that we deserve our water too I, I don't know if there can be co-management, but I think when if that and if and when that happens, that that'd be a great way of going about it. Uh, we have a question Thanks. by uh, Brian Toy. He asks, uh, for projects that do affect areas across arbitrary administrative borders, such as those between California and Oregon, uh, how can environmental policies or views overcome challenges imposed by the different administrative framework as a result of these borders? Are there ideas that can be circulated? Um, That's a great question. <laughs> um, um, yes. So this is a good point about the clan. I am talking a lot about something I didn't necessarily talk too much about here in the in my discussion. But on the Klamath River, there's been a, a new agreement towards dam removal on uh, four dams on the Klamath that have basically chokehold the river and make it so that the lower Klamath doesn't get as much water as the upper Klamath. Um, and th these are arbitrary borders. Um, so Oregon and California. And so the agreement came from tribal governments at the Yurok and Kruk uh, peoples and then um, Governor Newsom and then Governor Kate Brown and then Pacific Corp. So Pacific Corp owned, the, which is a subsidiary of Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, owns these dams on the Klamath. So it was a, it was a corporate interest that owns these hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams in the area, a utility company. Um, so those, all those interests came together to get a deal across these borders and these spaces. Um, so I think it can happen. Um, Oregon and California are also complementary states um, too. So similar ideals about the environment, I think, similar ideas about, you know, fairly neoliberal, but you know, these ideas about <laughs> environmental protection and then infrastructure projects as well. So this, both states determined that the, that dam, the, those dams were arbitrary, don't need them anymore. They don't produce hydroelectric act, as much hydroelectric activity anymore, cause more damage than, um, what 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 is um cause more damage let's just <laughs> end it at that um 
So I think that they can be circulated across borders, but it really matters in the administration that you're in. Like, look at the Trump administration. Like, they were not going to sign off on the Klamath River Dam's removal. They were just going to let it sit. Um, and then in California, the Trump administration, too, was pushing for more uh, water diversions and allocations to Central and Southern California from the Trinity and the Shasta Dam areas. So it really matters who's in power as well. It's like, are you going to get like a little bit hurt or a lot? And that's kind of how I see it. There's no like really, really good. There's just bad and not as bad. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, yeah, there, I think there's a lot of discussion around that too, especially in California because of the water issues here. Um, okay, next question, uh, Re Regina Alcazar asks, um, is there a framework, something like CEQA, that is created by indigenous nations that developers, planners can use in their work? Um, that's the question. Yeah, so in California, oh, sorry. No, I was um, going to say, if you could pair that question, Dylan, with Molly's last question. Molly has said, what might it look for California water planning to integrate indigenous ways of knowing and a uh, sense of place if we allow ourselves to imagine a world beyond CEQA? How else might we think about that? So these are two questions. One is about how would you do an alternative, I guess I think both are asking about what is an alternative to CEQA, to how we, I mean, not even just CEQA, but how do we think about creating a different world, regardless of the political mm -hmm. feasibility of that? Yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I need to think about that. Um, back into the indigenous nations having something that's similar to CEQA. Um, so every tribe in California is really different and they they situate economically, politically, culturally, like all, all, of, all the things that make people different in the world and nations in the world different are what uh, happens in California. So some tribes do have their own like tribal consultation policies that they require the state of California to engage with before they'll consult with the state, um, which has been interesting to see that. Um, and a lot of tribes have their own environmental planning departments. So they do their own studies um, and look at the effects of these projects based on their own understanding of science, which many you know tribal people are scientists, biologists, geologists, um, and they are housed within these places too. And so they review and push back on things that they feel are not scientifically sound um, and also feel that would be de detrimental culturally. So that's been nice to see how um, tribal like fisheries departments or environmental departments um, use in indigenous worldview to um, measure the environmental impacts through also like STEM. And, and you know bio, biological sciences. Um, so many people are fisher, fisheries folks and interact and look at the space and also looking at the delta smelt areas. So, so there is that interaction that occurs at the environmental level. I, I focus mainly on the tribal cultural resources because that's kind of where the, the, the direct interaction ha happens in CEQA. Um, I think looking beyond, it's really, Looking beyond CEQA. So I, I imagine like these decolonial futures where we're not always having to like check box off things. It's like, oh, great. We looked at the bio biology. Awesome. Great. That's so, oh, and then and the engineering and then the cultural resources, because that's what occurs now. And these environmental documents are done by people within silos that are only looking at their own space too. So it's not holistic. I think an indigenous view of environmental planning or environmental like infrastructure planning or water resources planning is looking at it holistically. It's not just, I'm gonna stay in my lane and only know about this one part of this document, but rather understanding the full picture. And it, occur, and it happens that 
tri when tribes are consulted, it's often from like the tribal liaison for the department. And so that tribal liaison is just that person that is designated to deal with tribes. And it's like, well, why aren't the biology scientists working with tribes and understanding the environmental impacts from a tribal perspective? Or why isn't like the public participation specialist working with tribes? It's because tribal knowledge is in these processes pigeonholed into one thing and a checkbox. And while the law is very, you know, innovative for California, it doesn't holistically engage with the ways that we see land and water which is quite different. So um, I, you know, would like more engagement from people who are doing these regulatory things to think beyond, you know, where they're at. And that's hard because where we live in a world that we only know and we can't imagine these decolonial futures or a world without these regulations. Um, but you know, I, I would argue to try, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's like the worst advice ever, but you know, just try to think beyond a decolonial space, a, a space that imagines a world without infrastructures. Um, and obviously that's probably not going to happen overnight on the Klamath river. You know, we've spent 20 years trying to get rid of these dams, but it happens and it can happen. Um, the Elwha River in Washington is a great example of that. The Elwha River Dam was removed and now water flows freely there. And fish have come back in two years when they thought it would take 20 years. There's a way to walk back these things. We just have to imagine a different world and a different future. And that means coming together. Um, you know, it's not just the indigenous worldview that matters. It's other, other worldviews as well, too. So well said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's another uh, question having to do with uh, kind of information and um, staying up to date with policies and regulations. Um, so Riwa asks, uh, how has Indigenous advocacy changed and adapted over time? Um, in times where there is so much misinformation and where there's an attempt to make decisions behind closed doors, how do you get information quickly and stay on top of new decisions being made by the state? Um, have you noticed or developed strategies uh, through which protest and advocacy can make a maximum impact um, and the role of social media? Those are all really good questions and I have answers to most of them, I think. Um, so Indigenous advocacy has changed, um, I think definitely over time and especially in the pandemic now. Um, we're forced to think about how to do our advocacy away from each other and while keeping each other safe. Um, I mentioned in the in the middle, I think, of the presentation that my great grandfather was doing advocacy against the Klamath River dams. And for us, this is kind of this is a long tradition. Um, maybe not the best tradition in the world, but it's something that people have felt like they've needed to do. So um, Standing Rock definitely highlighted um, Indigenous advocacy in 2016, but this has been happening for a very long time. And it, and it started, I think, in earnest. I mean, it started prior to this time period too, but really in earnest in the 1960s with the height of the Red Power Movement. Um, so you see more people speaking out about um, in the North Coast, in the North, Northern regions about um, salmon salmon fisheries so the fish wars uh led by billy frank in washington oregon um that pushed for the ability for to ad adhere to water uh, sorry adhere to tribal fishing rights because they had treaties that said that they had fishing and hunting rights that were being dismissed by the state so there's this long, very long history of advocacy that occurred both before that time and then after and into the present. Um, and a lot of it has been people protesting outside the state capitol, people pro protesting on the water. So that's always fun to see when people go out on boats and, you know, stop 
stop fishing game and, you know, block them to great personal risk. You know, people got to get arrested, have gotten arrested um, in that. So, I mean, I, I get information by asking a lot of people <laughs> or just like, um, I, you know, I have a conduit because I, I have a relationship with the state, but two, like being on top of the alerts that come out. So the EIRs are public. They have to tell, say the process and they have to say what they're doing related to these water infrastructure projects. And government websites are not the easiest to navigate, purposefully or not. Um, but so I continuously check the website and I've gotten involved. Um, I'm a board advisor for Save California Salmon. So we have policy interns and policy folks that keep us uh, updated on the things that are happening to in, in, in the water world, at least. So this whole process with the Delta tunnels to the Department of Water Resources credit has been fairly transparent and open. Like, they, like all the information was readily available when I was looking through it. Other projects like the site's reservoir, which is a proposed reservoir, are not as open. So it really runs the gamut and you really have to do a lot of investigative research. Um, if you want, if, if you feel like there is not, especially in California, um, public records acts requests are really beneficial because they do have to send over that information. Um, if somebody requests it on projects. So that, that's been actually when I was working at a different department. We would get PRAs all the time from environmental justice groups because they wanted to know what the permitting process was, where we were at in this process, because there wasn't a, a transparency that was happening. To their credit, and I think that's an important thing that environmental advocacy groups do a lot that is beneficial. Um, so, have I, the strategies, yes. Usually when a lot of people show up at a meeting and crash it and, and do a lot of public comment, that's where there's a lot of maximum impact. Because if you hold a public meeting and then nobody shows up, you're like, oh, well, that's great. We did our due diligence. Nobody, nobody cares about this. We could just continue on. But when people show up, and start talking about the issues around certain things related to environmental justice or indigenous environmental justice, then decision, later, um, decision makers pay attention. Um, so a big component of what we were doing on the Klamath River issues, actually recently in October 23rd, 2020, we did a big, big day in action and said, hey, tweet these people, so social media, this was a big part of it. Tweet these people, make comments, say, you need to remove the dams. Um, call these people. So calling their offices and saying, hey, what's happening with the Klamath River? What are you doing? How are you, how are you interacting with this, with us? Like, what are you gonna do into the, into, um, the present? Are you gonna remove the dams? Like asking these questions. Um, to the point where people are like, why are these, why are we getting calls <laughs> about what's happening? Um, but that was really effective. And social media campaigns for us have been really effective as well. So we had the Red Nation podcast, which is run by Nick Estes, is a pretty big, you know, um, native run podcast. I really recommend that too, if you're interested in the history of advocacy, um, not just in the United States, but beyond that too. It's a great um, uh, podcast and but we had them like we we took over their social media account so getting all of that information out was really beneficial for us um, and because of the pandemic you know we can't get together if we do decide to do an action which we did at the Capitol um, in on October 23rd only a few of us will go because it's dangerous um, and we don't want, you know, elderly, elderly people or young people to get sick. So that has changed quite a bit. But um, I think that right now with the Delta Conveyance Project and the Trinity, we're, we're waiting to see what's going to happen. And it very well can be that there might be an action if we're, we're seeing things that are not quite in line with what has been promised us, I guess. 
I think we have time for one more question because I believe this ends at 6.30. So uh, Linda, would you like to ask your question? Sure, thank you so much. Brittany, thank you so much for bringing um, all your research and personal insight and lived experience to our space. Really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, in this moment, this year has been one big crisis. Um, obviously for Native peoples, it's been a crisis since um, colonization happened. But for through COVID, through many other things, a, a lot of other people recognize the deep crisis that this country is in politically, the, the, you know, with 70 million people voting for Trump and 74 million voting for Biden, the, the, that the elections don't really change one way or the other and that there is a lot of deep work that has to actually happen. And at the same time that there is this kind of um, urgency that's presented by climate change, certainly a lot of recognition that there needs to be large scale action. And I was just listening to a podcast by um, Kyle Powers White um, mm -hmm. on that and kind of pushing back against that urgency claim and how a lot of urgency has led to um, really damaging and unethical things, whether that's a, you know, a lot, a lot there. But there's so much space or room, I think, for the climate uh, movement to do more harm or to, you know, for instance, if you look at Southern California, the kind of um, water resiliency needs could certainly lead to more pushes for extracting water from other places in order to secure urban resilience. And at the same time, there's a kind of crisis and maybe a, maybe optimistically speaking, a recognition that we need to build coalitions and that there is, as you noted, you know, when you um, saw the coalitions between recreational fishermen and indigenous tribes, that there are possibilities for recognizing the shared vulnerabilities and the shared interests across urban and rural divides across Republican and democratic, democratic divides, indigenous, black, white, Hispanic, all of those divisions. I, I guess I'm to close out, you know, as we uh, end this conversation, what space or opportunities are you seeing emerge in the space of 2020 for coalitions or bridge building between indigenous communities and, and the others? Or, or, or what spaces does climate open up or close for indigenous communities? Yeah, I mean, I think there is quite a bit of, um, you know, radical resurgence that's happening right now in 2020 in the ways that we're interacting with each other. So I'm thinking of like Tiffany King's work, the, the Black Shoals, which has really been influential to my way of thinking right now and the connections between Native studies and Black studies and the ways that we have not been, you know, with each other, I guess, for lack of a better word, or have been in solidarities with each other and why we need to get to that space and that. In, in that. Um, and I think there is like this moment right now is, is a time for this um, coalition building that needs to happen. And, and I would also say that, you know, this urgent urgency it's something we've been hearing for a long time. Um, and so when, <laughs> when you, um, you know, think about urgency, it's like, well, how are we sitting down and meeting each other, we're sitting down figuratively, but talking to each other and meeting each other where we're at and, and being in solidarities with each other too. So I think about, you know, environmental justice, non-Indigenous environmental justice communities and the things that they're facing in urban spaces. So like Bayview Hunters Point, which is a contaminated site in San Francisco and the things that they they have continuously had to, to deal with and, you know, creating these solidarities across spaces and culture and time um, is really foundational and important and something that I've been seeing a lot more happen, happen. And maybe it's because we're all in our like Zoom worlds right now and it's just easier to talk to each other. Um, but I think that will, that, that will happen and I have hopes that it'll happen. Um, and you know, our, my own, I can only really speak to my own organization, but we've been trying to build those connections too with folks in the Bay Area who do have an interest in the Bay Delta too, that are not just indigenous people, but you know, black commu communities, Asian communities, Latinx communities that are, are suffering as well. 
um, around that. And, you know, that also requires uh, an interaction with urban spaces, too, which admittedly, on our side, we haven't always been the best at because it's been a very contentious relationship. Um, but, you know, just an anecdote, I guess, when, when a lot of these water issues started happening in the North State, um, and the North State is very, like, you're it's like radical left or radical right. Like there's really very little in between that occurs there. Um, there was discussions with people on that side about what they wanted and what what it would look, what would it would mean to like build relationships with each other. And it's broken down and built up over time. Um, and I think it comes through. And and I think right now too, it's it's been really contentious because of the of Trump and. I mean, a lot of it is Trump country. So I don't have a clear answer other than that I hope that it, it, that this moment does create better bonds between people. Thank you so much for your presentation and answering all of our questions. I uh, really look forward to hearing uh, your work and your future work and um, I hope we can all stay in contact and build better relationships with one another. Thank, thank you. So you. If we could thank all you. unmute and give Brittany a live, thank you. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.